Good morning. Welcome back. If uh, you're a subscriber or you've been here before and uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, my name is Lori and I do videos about my experiences doing the Atkins diet. And uh, so this is my journey. So if you are interested in this sort of thing, uh, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to my channel. So with that, we are going through the book, Dr. Atkins Diet Revolution by Robert C. Atkins, MD. And he wrote this book in 1972. It was his first book he wrote about the diet. And uh, I hope that it uh, is something that will help you get going on this diet. And today's chapter, chapter 10, is called How to Take Your Own Dieting Case History. And uh, this will pretty much tell you, you know, what you need to do to get started. But before we get started, my little disclaimer here, I'm not a doctor, not a medical professional in any way. I'm just doing the Atkins diet and I'm sharing uh, what I learned along the way. So maybe it will help you. So go, before you do anything that I'm talking about, go see your doctor or other medical professionals and see what they have to say. So with that, let's get going. Let's pretend this is your first visit to my office. At this visit, I would give you a physical examination complete with a glucose tolerance test. But before that, I would start out by asking you certain questions. The questions that follow aren't the only ones I ask, but they include three main areas that it is important to explore. The first is your family history because it gives us the true picture as to your biological tendency to overweight. The second is a history of what has happened to you on previous diets. The third is an analysis of your present eating pattern. Suppose you get a pen and pencil and prepare to answer in writing the questions uh, I'll be putting to you in this chapter. So if you'd like, go grab a pen and pencil or pencil, something like that. <laughs> your children's health may uh, too may benefit. This operation will let you climb outside your skin and gather a little about your past, present, and probable future as far as weight control is concerned. You may get some big surprises. This new view of you may add years to your life and undreamed of vitality to your years. Even your children's health can benefit from what you learn in this chapter. You can't read your horoscope without knowing exactly when and where you were born, and it's difficult to treat your overweight successfully without knowing its birth date. As you read on, you'll understand why this is so. Was it before you were conceived, in your babyhood, adolescence, after your pregnancies, recently, or did it come on gradually and insidiously over the years? Get a doctor's eye view of you. By the time you finish reading this book, what we're going to find out is to what extent you're overweight <clears throat> due to carbohydrate poisoning. How and what, to what extent does your particular heredity, body type, and diet history account for this met metabolic disorder? And what is likely to happen to you as a result of this disturbed carbohydrate metabolism if you ignore it? When you finish answering the questions that follow, you'll see your situation with a new objectivity. First, let's talk about your family. Please answer these questions on the pad of paper I've asked you to take up. Your mother's approximate height, your father's approximate height, what was the most your mother ever weighed, what was the most your father ever weighed, to calculate the approximate degree of their overweight, if any, multiply the number of inches over five feet by five for a woman, seven for a man, 
uh, then add 100. For example, a woman 5 feet 6 inches should weigh in the neighborhood of 130 pounds. A man of 5 feet 6 inches should weigh somewhere around 142 pounds. That's very roughly the ideal weight for anyone, including you. For a more exact idea, uh, see the tables later in the book. Now, for me personally, my mom was kind of short. I'm five foot eight. And I think my mom was probably right around five foot, maybe a little under five foot. Now, my dad, on the other hand, he was like six foot tall. So it was really kind of funny to see my mom and my dad. Uh, she might not have been under five foot, but she just seemed really short. Of course, all of us were tall, so that could be why too. But yeah, and my mom was overweight. I don't know what her weight was. She, of course, never told. My dad was always pretty thin. So they were just complete opposites in that way. Do you have brothers uh, and sisters who are overweight? How much? The majority of you whose parents and siblings are overweight have a weight problem yourself. My sister was always struggling with her weight from what I remember. When I was, we were seven years apart. She was older than me. And I just remember her always talking about how lucky I was because I could eat anything and not gain a pound, not gain an ounce. And she would always be kind of upset because she was always, I, don't, I didn't think of her as fat, but she was a little bit overweight, you know. And so she... Her and my mom were always talking about how to eat healthier and things like that. And they always had a thing for sweets, you know, and I mean, all of us do. So I do. And I remember we grew up Catholic and I remember how the two of them would always struggle when we were supposed to fast. And I'd be like, What's the big deal? I didn't really think too much of it. But, yeah, that's it's just something I noticed, you know. It's not saying anything bad about people that have that struggle, but I just noticed that about them. Now, when I got older, I still don't feel like I snack a lot, but it's just as I got older, the then uh, I started gaining weight. So... We'll get into that later in this chapter. Can you think of any member of your family who has had diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, parents, grandparents, sisters, brothers, uncles, and aunts? Well, my mom had diabetes. She had a sister that had diabetes type 1 as a child and ended up dying from it. Uh, she's got another sister that has it now, has type 2. My mom had type 2. And uh, I'm not sure all who had it in the earlier generations, but I know my mom always said that diabetes was in the family. Um, I'm not sure what the problem was, but my grandmother had a uh, some kind of heart condition because I remember her going to the doctor all the time and they were checking on her blood pressure and they were talking about her heart. And eventually she went into the nursing home after she had gone in the hospital. I don't know if she had a heart attack or what happened, but I was young then. My dad's side, well, my dad had cancer. He didn't have any diabetes or anything. And to my knowledge, nobody on my dad's side of the family did. So everything I'm getting here is from my mom's side. Are your parents living? If not, how old did they live to be? If they died natural deaths, the answer strongly suggests to what extent longevity runs in your family. No, my parents are not living. And my dad died of cancer. I was a freshman in high school in 1991. 
I believe he was like in his mid to late 50s, like maybe 54, 56, somewhere in there, I'm thinking. My mom died. It's kind of complicated, but uh, I think her diabetes got to her. She would had been telling me that she just didn't have the energy she used to, and I think her body just kind of quit on her, but it just happened to be while she was driving a car. So luckily no one else got hurt except for her and my sister. But uh, yeah, so my mom was just turned 70, I believe. So she was pretty old well, in my thinking, I guess 70 is not that old. At any rate, uh, let's see. How long were they in good health? What was the cause of death? Answers to all the questions above. Give us a hint to your special vulnerabilities. When, when I was a young kid, I remember my dad having a surgery on his esophagus. And I believe that that was the first of his issues with, uh, with cancer. And I'm not sure how long he had had it before then. Because my parents didn't even say anything about him having cancer. They just said something's wrong with his esophagus and he has to have part of it cut out. And as I grew up in, in adulthood and I suddenly realized one day I was like, that was the beginning of his cancer. Yeah, it took me a while to figure that one out. I was a kid. I didn't know. <laughs> but and like I said with my mom, you know, she was 70. So... She lived a good long life, I'd say. Let's see. Like father, like son. I think that when a parent and child have the same body build and the same height, the child could well look to what kind of illness his parents had. And if it was heart disease, he'd better be careful. I feel that if you don't pay attention to these matters at the earliest possible age, which always is now, it can be too late. If you just wait until you already have the symptoms of diabetes or heart disease, you've undoubtedly waited too long. High triglyceride levels, high cholesterol levels, high insulin levels, and high blood sugar levels run in families. These four risk factors are all interrelated and they all tend to appear where there is a family history of overweight. If this is your background, this is very important. It means that your life expectancy is 80% dependent on what you eat, which may govern those levels, and how well you take care of yourself. Now let's talk about you and what happened to you on previous diets. I suggest that you also write down the answers to the following questions that help to externalize your situation. Let you see more clearly where you are in life. Your age, your height. This, oddly enough, is a figure many people exaggerate. Get ready to be both honest and surprised. Measure yourself with a yardstick on a door jam. Well, I have just turned 45 at the end of May. And like I said, I am five foot eight inches. I've been that same height for years. And yes, I know it is actually accurate. I don't know why I would exaggerate that. <laughs> um, let's see. What is your ideal weight? If you once were at your ideal weight, you'll remember it. Otherwise, use the tables in the back of the book. Well, I was 160 through high school. I never changed. I didn't gain a pound. I didn't lose a pound. It was really weird. I was always exactly 160. I don't know if it was the mentality because of my mom and sister always struggling or what, but I think I was a little overweight then. Um, so I would say somewhere between 150 and 160 would be the ideal weight, but I would be happy if I could ever get down to 160. Were you a fat baby? Get out those baby pictures or cross-examine your older relatives. If you are a fat baby, 
you need this diet more than most people. The earlier you put it on, the harder the struggle to lose and the, sick, uh, the sicker your metabolism as a rule. Especially Omnius is overweight that began before the age of 10. I was a little bit chubby as a baby, but I don't think it was fat. I think it was just that normal little baby fat that's on everybody, but whatever. I don't know. Excuse me. What do you think first caused you to put on weight? What is the least you ever weighed as an adult or even in your late teens? If you looked well then, that weight might still be your goal weight. I'm not really sure what caused me. I think it just kind of slowly started adding on. But then after I had my kids, that's when it really started to add on. What's the most you ever weighed? If you are not at your all-time high weight, remember that your peak weight is one which you might be expected to level off at if you were not dieting. When was that? I would say, I can't remember exactly, but I'd say in the range of 250 pounds was my highest. Um, and it wasn't that long ago, a couple of years ago. So there is that. Now it is time to look in the mirror of your dieting past. What diets have you been on? List them, and after each diet, note these seven things. Your age, how much did you lose? How did you feel on the diet? For example, were you hungry? How was your energy level? Were you bored? How long were you on it? Why did you quit? How much did you gain back? How fast did you gain it? Well. I remember at one point in time, I was in my 20s, I think, probably late 20s, mid to late 20s. I tried the slim fast thing. I would have a shake for lunch and then eat a sensible dinner, as they say. <laughs> I don't know if it was that sensible, but I was always hungry. Those shakes just don't fill you up. And it just... No, it didn't do any good, which is a little side story. I kind of had to laugh. I used to work at Wendy's around that, and, you know, a lot of different times in my life I worked there. <clears throat> there was this guy that used to come in, and he would order a large Frosty every day for lunch or during the lunch rush. Then one day he told me, he said, those slim fast shakes are supposed to work, so I've been having this large frosty and instead. <laughs> High sugar content there. After a while, he stopped doing that, and he started ordering normal food. So, don't try that. Let's see, what other... I've tried just... I've never been able to count calories, but I've tried reducing how much I eat... I've tried, you know, just making better choices like having a salad instead of whatever else that I would have normally had. And I've tried a lot of different things like that. I did do well on the Atkins diet before, but I'll be honest, what stopped me from doing it was this kid at work kept making fun of me. He was telling me how Dr. Atkins is even fat. He died from a heart attack, which, by the way, is not true. Um, and he told me all these different things on how unhealthy it was because I'm having no carbs, which is not true. We have carbs. We just don't have the unhealthy ones, and we don't have a lot of them. Uh, he, he just... It was like every day when I'd go on break and get my food, he would just attack me basically because of it. And I finally just, I gave up on it. I couldn't deal with the negativity. So I just 
man, if I really think about it now, I can only imagine where I'd be today if I would have stuck with it, if I would have been the person I am now that has, you know, I stand up for myself and things. I just, wow. So anyway, let's see. What would be the virtues of an ideal diet for you? Would it have to solve a hunger problem? Yes. Or a boredom problem? That was never an issue for me. If it is either of the two, you are in luck. For this diet solves these problems. The hunger would be cured by the diet itself and the boredom by all the wonderful recipes as well as the variety the diet affords. Let's go back to question number five. Nothing is more important to your success with this diet than to think yeah, and carefully about your answer to question five. Why have you quit in the past? Take time to go into this a bit. Well, I, for, for I, I don't know. When I did the slim fast thing, it was the hunger. It just wasn't working for me. Cravings get me the best, I guess. When I have gone off of uh, like eating salads and healthier foods, I got, well, I guess a little bit of boredom too. I got tired of salads. <coughs> Excuse me. And, but mostly I think that the uh, craving for sweets gets me and cravings for pizza and Mexican and things like that. All right. Did you stop because there was something wrong with the diet? It didn't work or it left you hungry, bored you or all the above? Or was it just because you loved eating more than being slim? In other words, because you didn't really care enough about your appearance and health to stay on it. Or did you quit because something upsetting happened in your life about then so that you were under unusual stress and the stress of going hungry was more than you could handle on top of it? Pause and tote up just how many times you've started a diet and then quit. Do you find that you quit different diets and base for basically similar reasons? Don't be discouraged as a result of reviewing your dieting past. Be objective. Try and see yourself as the doctor might see you, as your doctor might see you. There's real value in this exercise for you. You're going to be given an easier, more enjoyable, more efficient diet than you've ever experienced. But when it comes to changing your eating habits, even though there's no hunger or boredom involved, it's vital to realize with crystal clearness the role that you and your values play. To make even the world's best diet work, you've got to care. No diet, no matter how perfectly conceived, is more than a tool, an instrument that the motivated individual can use to accomplish a goal he wants. No diet can make you lose weight. Now that's the key right there. We have to care. We have to want it bad enough. That is it right there. <clears throat> Part three of your diet profile. What is your eating pattern? Now let's try to get a picture of your eating habits. That's where we'll be starting from. What is your usual carbohydrate intake? What, that's what is important. I hear many people say, well, actually, I don't think I take in very many carbohydrates. I don't take sugar in my coffee. I seldom eat gooey desserts. And at dinner, I just don't put bread on the table anymore. Well, that's all to the good, but it isn't good enough. Good as it is. If A, you're overweight, and B, you aren't metabolizing carbohydrates properly. Either or both of these conditions indicate that you're still taking in too many carbohydrates for you. Our national eating habits, uh, being what they are, it's easy to take in 50% of your calories in carbohydrates, even if you don't have a mouthful of sweet teeth. How many carbohydrates do you take in per day? 
I want you to find out for yourself what your usual carbohydrate quota is, like this. For three days minimum, a week would be better, eat and drink just as you usually do. No virtuous abstainings. Just relax and do what comes naturally. Write down everything you put in your mouth, liquid or solid. Quantities, too, as nearly as you can guess. Carry a notebook in your purse, and just as soon as you've eaten or drunk, jot it down. If you wait to do it later, you're all too likely to forget something. Forget calories. Just write down the item and quantity. Later on, look up and then add the grams of carbohydrates you're taking in. To do this, simply look up the item in the carbohydrate gram counter mentioned earlier in chapter nine. Use the gram counter just as you use a calorie counter, only it's carbohydrate grams you want. Today, you can just Google it. Just put in how many carbs does blah have, or just food item, carb count or something like that and you'll find it it's really it's everywhere this is an important exercise why because you see your eating habits through new eyes it makes your carbohydrate con makes you carbohydrate conscience carbohydrate wise as nothing else can could a sample day's eating go something like this Let's take what might be a sample day's eating for most people who think they are eating carefully to keep their weight under control. It's not a dieting day. It's just an ordinary, cautious eating day. Breakfast, six ounces of orange juice, a cup of cornflakes, one cup skim milk, one tablespoon sugar, coffee without sugar. Uh, let's see. Coffee break, one cup of fruit yogurt. Lunch, four ounce hamburger on a roll, three tablespoons ketchup, one half cup of coleslaw, diet Pepsi, 12 ounces. Before dinner, two ounces of gin, eight ounces, uh, one eight ounce glass of tonic, 10 potato chips. Dinner, one cup of tomato soup, six ounce steak, baked potato, three fourths cup of peas, one half honeydew melon, coffee without sugar, bedtime, one glass of skim milk and one small banana. Total carbohydrates, 300. That's a lot. And it shows the number of carbohydrates in each individual thing here. I'm trying to adjust. There we go. I don't know if you can really see that, but take a screenshot and blow it up. This is six or seven times as much carbohydrate as you can take in and hope to maintain a weight loss. As for losing on this high and on this high in intake of carbohydrate, forget it. Though a few carbohydrate sensitive people can maintain a reasonable weight on 60 grams of carbohydrate per day. My experience with thousands of such patients, as I said earlier, is that the majority find their critical carbohydrate level to be 40 grams daily or less. When they take in more than that, they get hungry and then gain. Yet you can see how easy it is to overeat carbohydrate in today's culture, even for people who think that they're on a diet and who go hungry and therefore some days go overboard altogether and eat their heads off. Take Mary Lou's eating pattern. Mary Lou is secretary to one of my friends. She doesn't eat breakfast. Lunch is usually soup and a sandwich, around 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrate in the soup, 24 grams in the two slices of sandwich bread, and a few more grams for the filling. Around four or five o'clock, she has a medium-sized apple, 20.5 grams. If she doesn't go out for dinner, she has a frozen TV dinner. Swanson's Chinese dinner is a favorite. It contains 40.5 grams of carbohydrate and is fairly average for the light frozen TV dinners. 
Remember when we used to call them TV dinners? <laughs> While her dinner is heating, she munches on carrot strips. 5.6 grams of carbohydrate per one half cup. She skips dessert. Before bed, she has a glass of skim milk, 13.4 grams of carbohydrate. Because she has been so good all day, no Danish at coffee break time, no dessert for either lunch or dinner, no drink before dinner, she rewards herself with three Nabisco Fig Newtons along with her milk, another 30.3 grams of carbohydrate. Total for her dieting hungry day, around 160 grams of carbohydrate. And if she drinks her favorite Diet 7-Up or Diet Right or Diet Pepsi during the day, another nine grams of carbohydrate goes down her unwary gullet with every six ounces. Reread your own biography. Read over the notes you have made about yourself. Get a clear picture of the person you are, the person whose eating habits are going to be retained so that you can't possibly go back to eating the, uh, eating the killing old ways. Does this sound impossible? Thousands of my patients are evidence that it is possible, not only possible, but painless. But first you must realize the extent, the seriousness of your weight problem, just as I do after interviewing a patient. That's where answering those questions will help you. Let's suppose you're Mrs. A, for example. Your parents were slim, healthy, long-lived. This is the first time you've ever dieted. You're middle-aged, but you never ate desserts, and you played tennis, you kept your figure. And it's only recently, since your husband died, that the scales told you you were wavering between 10 and 15 pounds over your lifetime weight. If your case history is anything like Mrs. A, you have no problem at all comparatively. On this diet, you'll drop that weight without the slightest effort and you'll keep it off easily with a very comfortable CCL of, of probably 60 grams of carbohydrate per day. Your spirits will per perk up too and your interest in men. Does your case history read like this? On the other hand, your dieting profile may be born like that of Mrs. C. Your parents were overweight and either or both were diabetic. You have been on the plump side ever since you were a baby. You have tried a great many diets. You lose, but you regain even more than you lost. But na by now you're veering toward being 50 to 80 pounds over your ideal weight. You love sweets. You're a night eater. That's me. Well, Mrs. C, you're like most of my patients. You can become a model size and stay that way. And you will feel wonderful while you're shedding both weight and a disproportionate number of inches. But you're playing for much higher stakes than Mrs. A. You're playing for your life. And your commitment to the project must be total. That doesn't mean that you must suffer privi privation or hunger or discomfort. But it does mean that you've got to put away once and for all, all the naive idea that you can diet for a while until you've lost the worst and then go energetically back to digging your grave with your teeth. You're not weak willed. You're not a glutton, but you are sick, very sick. Getting well must be your first concern. You can never look forward to not being on a diet. You know, a lot of times I compare this with alcoholism. And here I'm seeing it again. If you are an alcoholic, you can't just say, I'm going to have a little bit of alcohol. And you can't just quit it for a little while. You have to dig in, stop drinking today, and never touch a drop again. If you, if you have one sip, you're going to relapse. And it's the same here. If you are, they're calling this a, an allergy to carbohydrates. And if you're allergic to them, 
then if you go back and start eating the old way again, you're going to get back the way you were. So this is a lifetime decision. Or are you Mr. or Mrs. B? You're not Mrs. A. You're not Mrs. C. Perhaps your case history is more like that of Mr. or Mrs. B. One. Oh, sorry, one or both of your parents were overweight, but you were slim until your pregnancies. That's me, sort of. Or Mr. B until a few years after you got out of the army. You tried various diets. You lose, but of course, sooner or later, you gain it back. You'd be happy. Uh, You'd be happy people if you could just drop 20 to 30 pounds. On the other hand, lots of people you know are in the same boat, and dieting is such a bore. It isn't as if you ate ignorantly. You ate carefully, except during vacations and the holiday seasons, of course. Plenty of fruit, not much fat, no bread on the table, and you play golf, you swim, you even do the Royal Canadian Air Force exercises most mornings, RCAF. Mr. and Mrs. B, you have my sympathy. That right. Uh, you don't deserve to be loaded. Uh, you don't deserve to be loaded down with those unpleasant extra pounds. But because we're not on guard against the carbohydrates that are the major cause of those creeping pounds, we're innocent victims of carbohydrate-itis, the insidious, invisible, all-persuasive plague of our century. But once you know what causes this disease, Mr. and Mrs. B, you can lick it and without a pang. Take my own history. I didn't have either a doctor or a book like this to help me. I have a big appetite and no one has ever accused me of having willpower. Yet, I've been able to train myself so that when I walk into a cocktail party with a smorgasbord, that picture doesn't even reach my brain. The picture I see goes from my eye to my hand. My eye will see protein, which I call my food. It will not even see their food, the carbohydrates. I just automatically grab the protein. I don't even have to think about it because it's a habit, a habit that by now has become a reflex. At first, I thought about it. Now I don't have to think about it anymore. I am Mrs. B. Retrained eating can be as reflex as brushing your teeth. And this is what I propose to you for, uh, to do for you. I propose to train you to a pattern of eating habits that will hold fast even in the midst of a serious emotional upheaval. Businessmen who come to me sometimes say on that first visit, but doctor, I'm under such pressure. I tell them, under pressure, you don't forget to brush your teeth. Even if you're in the midst of a corporate upheaval, you'll still remember that. Why? Because it's so important? Or because it's such a habit. What I hope this book will do for you is to train you to have good eating habits that are just as built in as brushing your teeth. That's the end of that chapter. <laughs> yeah. No lie. This is hard. If we want to do this, we have to commit. This is not a temporary thing that will fix it all. This is a lifelong journey. Like Lori's journey. This is something we have to live with. We have to understand that we have to make the choices. Either A, we're going to live a life of being overweight possibly get diabetes, heart conditions, all sorts of things, die young because we were sick, be uncomfortable, hurt all the time. The life of an overweight person is not a fun life. Or B, 
commit to getting rid of those carbs, commit to doing our best to eat better, and make better choices on a daily basis and see the weight come off. I haven't been doing well the last couple of months. I've, I'm not sure, I don't know. I'd have to sit down and really think about it, but I know I've been having a lot of things that are not exactly low carb. I've been having a lot of things that are just not as healthy. I'm trying to make more food at home, but it's hard. You know, we're all busy. I'm going to school, and this summer my class is, wow, I didn't know what I was taking on this summer. They told me that it would be about 18 hours per week homework. I'm learning Java. It's a language and computers, in case you don't know. And it's hard to keep up. I've got to read the chapter and <clears throat> take my notes while I read. And there's an assignment that uh, it asks questions throughout the chapter of the reading. So I keep my laptop open and answer all those questions. And then I uh, have other assignments I have to do. And then it's like, okay, how did they say to do this? Got to go and check it out. And uh, it's a real struggle learning something like this. And so some of it is coming together for me, but yeah, it's hard. So then I'm dealing with that, and then I've got to go cook dinner. And so I try to tell myself, okay, at 5 o'clock, I'm going to quit what I'm doing and do that. But sometimes, you know, you're right in the middle of something, and it just, you can't quit while you're on to something, you know? And I do have some things in the freezer that I can take out and thaw out and warm up. But, and sometimes after I've been working so hard on trying to figure this out, then it becomes really hard to wrap my brain around cooking. But I've been doing better on that. But the weekends really get me. I've typically been a person that goes out to eat on the weekends. When my husband and I were dating, really got in the habit of that. He lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and oh man, there's so many restaurants up there. They're so good. And so whenever I'd go up there to see him, we'd eat out the whole weekend. I mean, it wasn't my house. I wasn't going to cook. And so that was just the way things were. And then when he'd come down here to visit me, uh, we do the same thing. It's a really bad habit we got into. And I've always felt kind of uh, uncomfortable cooking for somebody, except for my own kids. So that was a change for me to be able to cook for my new husband when we got married. And we've been married since 2017. So four years coming up here in July and yeah it's just it's a struggle every day for all of us I'm just glad I'm not working some office job or or some other job where I don't get home till six seven o'clock I'd have to put everything in the slow cooker that's the only way I'd be able to feed my family, which that's okay. You know, there's a lot of good healthy dinners that you can put in a slow cooker. You can make a roast and you can, I've heard of people making meatloaf in the slow cooker. I've never done it, but hey, I mean, if that's what you need to do, get it ready the night before, put it in the refrigerator, and then before you go to work in the morning, put it in the slow cooker and there's just 
And maybe that's what I need to start doing on some of those days that I know it's a possibility that I might not be able to cook, which I do. I do use the slow cooker a lot of times. But anyway, that's all there is with this book today. I hope that uh, this was helpful to you. And uh, he's got several books after we're done with this. I'm not going to read all of them to you, but I think I'm going to read another one of his books on my own. But anyway, we've only got a few chapters left. This is so we got chapter 11. Let's see. I'll just kind of go through this quick. Chapter 12. Uh, that's yeah. Chapter 13. How to follow it level by level. 14. Dealing with people that are getting stuck on the diet. And then we got meal pan, plans and recipes. I'm not going to read that chapter. So that might be it. Yeah. Oh, and then there, I do want to read the statement from Dr. Atkins at the end of the book. That's really good. It was an eye opener of what was really going on. So, and the last chapter, why we need a revolution on a diet. There's some really good information in there. I hope that you guys are enjoying the, uh, the readings from this book. And after we're done with that, I've got some other things I'm thinking about. Um, I did, I was planning on doing my uh, three-month update today, but I didn't get my pictures ready. So I will hopefully do that next week. And since I'm really busy with my class, if I don't, have a live stream it's probably because i'm busy with that because i'm getting behind or something but i really like talking to you guys i hope you know that it helps me to stay on track you know this was an eye opener to me today writing down everything that you eat for three days i think i'm gonna do that again because well i didn't do that actually the first time around before starting it but i uh I started logging on my fitness pal and I just can't stick with that for some reason. So maybe I'll try this idea of writing down what I'm eating for the next three days and see where that goes. At any rate, I think that was an eye opener and also uh, going into the genetic history and things of my family and dieting as as I did when I read this to myself, I didn't really answer it. But when I talk to you guys through it, I really feel like I want to help you by telling you my story. So I don't know. It is what it is, but that's all I got. So I hope it helped you in some way until next time.